What do you want me to do? You just want me to hit you. Come on, do me just one favor. Why? Why? I don't know why. I don't know. Never been in a fight. You? No, but that, that's a good thing. No, it is not. How much can you know about yourself if you've never been in a fight? This is crazy. You want me to hit you? <laughs> that's right. What, like in the <laughs> face? <laughs> Surprise me. Hit me in the ear! Well, Jesus, I'm sorry. Ow! Christ! No, you hit me. Come on! We should do this again sometime. Despite the first two rules of Fight Club, ordering... You do not talk about Fight Club. It's clear that nobody within the film or outside in the real world took any note. With the partner fight clubs taking hold across the US within the narrative still receiving incredible attention over 20 years on. But perhaps this dichotomy is far more important than the film lets on, with the film about counterculture conformity ignoring its own rules to ensure its commercial and consumer congenial values remain ever present. While much of contemporary culture refers to Fight Club as a film alone, it's incredibly important to recall the fact that David Fincher's not-so-cult classic is an incredibly faithful adaptation of Chuck Palahniuk's novel of the same name. The novel was released in 1996, which Palahniuk describes clearly with his tongue lodged into his cheek as The Great Gatsby Updated Little. These residues of postmodernism's bipolar approach to consumerism and art pervade the entire piece, which is, of course, inevitable when you're selling a product and ideology which itself is denouncing consumerism. But this confused division is most gloriously apparent through, be warned, this is a spoiler, just like the rest of this video will be, the fact that the emasculated narrator and the hypermasculine Tyler Durden are one and the same person. Because we're the same person. That's right. We are the all singing, all dancing. I don't understand this. Okay, that was a lot of information. Let's start from the beginning. Although the plot's opening is a little convoluted, narratively, we begin with the film's unnamed narrator, who we'll call Jack, after one of the nicknames he adopts in the film, running a dead-end job as an automobile recall specialist and suffering from severe insomnia as a result of his deep dissatisfactions. Posing as a sufferer of testicular cancer, among other ills, his only catharsis is found by weeping his eyes out attending support groups, surrounding himself with the mortally sick despite his stable physical health. He spends his time and hard-earned money scouring the IKEA catalogue, filling up his house with items which he, ironically or not, knows will not fill the hole in his life. Nevertheless, he's caught in the cycle of working, buying, crying and failing to sleep, unable to feel content about anything. But he lives in a free world, within the very self-proclaimed land of the free. So why is this freedom not exercised? Scholar Omar Lizardo gives us fuel for thought here, explaining, The crucial point to keep in mind here is that consumption is not to be seen as the opposite of discipline in any meaningful sense, but as an alternative form of discipline. And this is clear. Jack's ability to express his freedom and cure his ailments comes in clear, standardized packages, either ordered from a catalog or chosen from a timetable on the wall, resulting in his uncomfortable stasis in a consumerist delirium where you're never really asleep and you're never really awake. But thanks to the violent disruption by Marla Singer, suffering a similar late consumer syndrome in an albeit vastly different way to Jack, entering the support groups and disrupting the peace he had found, that and of course his apartment deciding to blow up in an incredibly mundane explosion, the result of a gas leak and the refrigerator switching on, later discovered to be the work of Tyler Durden, amalgamating into, for Jack, a world-shattering explosion and ejection from the everyday, allowing him to be swept off his feet by Tyler Durden, or more to the point, allowing him to invent a coping mechanism to survive the shockwaves. Please just give me something. Red and blue, two and all, lipstick, red, sack and alls. No. You need healthy, natural sleep. Tyler quickly points out all of Jack's flaws, that he's firmly in the grip of consumerism, and as a result, has no agency of his own. As they walk out the back of a dingy sleaze bag bar, Tyler tells him to forget his chains and to punch. As for a down-and-out disregard for the system they'd served, what mode of communication is more effective than violence? This brawl results in the formation of the first Fight Club, held aloft by its eight rules and timed meetups. The Fight Club frames itself as an escape from the everyday, a moment where the most underpaid, underskilled drone of capitalism can feel like a king. But as Jack explains, But Fight Club only exists in the hours between when Fight Club starts and when Fight Club ends. And who you were in Fight Club is not who you were in the rest of the world. 
two sentiments which sound awfully similar to the establishment-bound self-help support groups that Jack had lurked within to cure his insomnia. In other words, Jack had essentially just created his own support group, with the seed of a revolutionary group resembling capitalist establishments while actively attempting to go against the capitalist ball and chain around their members' ankles, the contradictions begin to pour in. <laughs> the Fight Club quickly evolves with Tyler's dilapidated home to shift into an entire anti-materialist, anti-corporate, revolutionary cult dubbed Project Mayhem, an organization whose first rule is sinisterly, Sir, the first rule of Project Mayhem is you do not ask questions, sir. Its main members come from the fight clubs, but they're drafted in through an albeit bureaucracy-free application process. The applicants stand outside the house for three days without food or water, standing tall and strong. They are repeatedly abused both physically and verbally by their recruiters, who ensure that their individuality is reduced to a blank slate. Then, if accepted, they enter to shave their heads and become nothing. In turn, by becoming nothing, they bring anarchy to the regimented, organized, capital-driven world, blowing up corporate buildings and artworks and demolishing coffee shops alike. But in reducing everything to this base level value of nothingness, they enact a nihilistic contradiction, whereby reveling in meaninglessness provides the grounds for gratifying activity. In short, to the members of Project Mayhem, nothing is everything. <laughs> But if we take a closer look at these anarchists, there's a complexity. Just like how the mid-90s saw the skaters' counterculture ideologies burst into popular culture, forcing the rebellious attitude to become little more than an aid in pushing products, Tyler's Project Mayhem becomes part of the capitalist system. First, revisiting its application process, it requires applicants who have been whittled down to nothing by wealth-driven work ethic to join forces and remain downtrodden, no-face drones, fulfilling the wishes of another higher power, which, although not corporate, relies on the same hierarchy of power as big business. This higher power is, of course, Tyler Durden, and, at risk of overusing the concept, it's clear that he's formed his own cult of personality, whereby Tyler becomes the only individual in the sea of black clothes and shaped hair. Members of the group are even forced to denounce their names, leaving Tyler in the position of a god among men, the only free spirit to which aimless individuals flock to in search of an answer. Tyler may be becoming a dictator-like figure to his group of people, but according to mid-century philosophers like Theodore Adorno, capital itself is equitable to such a dictator. It is a figure which itself cannot be tarnished. Its reputation as an essential giver of life, opportunity and value is retained above all else. By setting up a rival cult of personality based on terrorizing the hegemonic one, it becomes clear that Tyler's Project Mayhem relies on capitalist structures themselves. But even more complex is their reliance on the gaze of the system to validate the group's existence. This is seen clearly when the characters return from setting a building ablaze with a flaming smiley face to find their smiles, laughs and sense of accomplishment coming from the very mouth of the master, the news. They watch reporters shooting and discussing their accomplishment. And here we have to ask, what's so different between this act of vandalism appearing on the news or an act of triumph appearing there? Both justify the act as important, and in an individualist society, nothing is as much of a commodity as importance. In short, the anarchists find their value in the defined capitalist system of approval, despite them going against its ideals. Such an observation points to the whole idea of Fight Club being, ultimately, conforming to established capitalist codes. This is only solidified further as they sit there drinking beer, making enough money to stay afloat by selling soap to the super rich, and end up establishing franchises across the country. And don't for a second underestimate Jack's use of the word franchise here. A franchise being an inherent, wealth-grabbing, money-bound marketing concept for big business solidifies this revolution as one enacted within, not in opposition to, the system. A generation of men raised by women. I'm wondering if another woman is really the answer we need. Both the novel and film suggest that modern society emasculates men. Themes touched on by Tyler, who tries to encourage a return to primal masculinity through the brutality of the fight clubs, as a direct contrast to the tattered masculinity of consumerism, which relies on peace, indifference, and arguably an overarching tendency towards being effeminate. Fight Club enables defeated men to rediscover this raw, primal masculinity, with each of the guys subjecting themselves to pain and serving out the same pain to others. For Tyler, masculinity is a physical state, an awareness of one's body, and a willingness to use it to satisfy deep-seated aggressive needs. I felt like destroying something beautiful. 
We also see this with the introduction of Marla, who disrupted the peace in the first place and continued to make Jack unstable throughout his descent into anarchy. While Jack is unable to give in to his primal nature, Tyler dominates Marla sexually, enacting the things Jack never could. And just as the support groups Jack had attended early on in the film provided its members with a respite from their physical and psychological ills, Fight Club is also a support group that offers its members a chance to reinvigorate their life. Through this, it's easy to see Tyler as the necessary masculinity required to succeed with women and take control. But as the novel and film reach their respective ends, their portrayal of masculinity is more complicated. Ultimately, we're left with the feeling that raw, unchecked masculinity is just as, if not more toxic than an emasculated consumerist society. But as we approach Ground Zero, where Project Mayhem attempt to reset the entirety of the financial system by demolishing all the buildings which hold credit card records, Jack has a change of heart and goes against the codes. He gives in to his human cares and falls deeper in love with Marla, becomes deeply traumatized when his friend Bob is killed in action, and enacts revenge on Angel Face. No, seriously, that's Jared Leto's character's name. These moments provide a rupture of emotion in an organization which is founded on applications, rules, regulations, standardization, and not asking questions, and, in many ways, provide the perfect counterpoint to the fundamentals of capitalism for the exact same reason. Only after these emotions have ruptured the hard shell of masculinity which controlled Jack can he confront Tyler Durden and progress out of this cycle of recreating counterculture capitalism on capitalist values and systems. Tyler and Jack brawl through the film's final act, finding them on the top floor of a derelict office building and a gun placed firmly inside of Jack's mouth. But Jack takes agency here, overruling the dominant masculinity of Tyler, and he shoots himself in the head, killing Tyler in the process. Jack managed to take back control, offering his hand to Marla in one of the film's only respites of human embrace, only by killing off the preconceived agent of franchised chaos. The bombs go off around them and the credit card company buildings fall into rubble, but this is not a disaster. Both components have been dealt with. The capital itself has been destroyed, with credit card companies now unable to run, and Tyler, the figurehead of Project Mayhem, is also dead. There is a new beginning ahead, and perhaps one that is bright, as it's based on emotion, primarily compassion. Despite Project Mayhem's attempts to go against capitalism, they somehow established a system which resembled it. And regardless of shaving their heads and dressing them in all black, the members of the cult still remained individuals. Contradictions like these sit at the heart of the film, but they're not problematic. They point to similar contradictions in the real world. Through Fight Club's anti-establishment ideologies, we're presented with two possible ways out of this conundrum, both of which are enacted by Jack. Obviously, bullet to the head is not a very logical conclusion to deconstruct the impact of a consumer-driven society. This is why the film has another answer, a turn towards compassion and interpersonal warmth, presented by Jack finally embracing Marla and denouncing Tyler and Project Mayhem's destructive natures. And with that, it's clear why the first rule of Fight Club is... You do not talk about Fight Club. Because when entrapped in such a deeply rooted system, Doing what you're supposed to do, or doing the exact opposite, results in the same ends. Which is why you are most certainly meant to talk about Fight Club. Nia, you talking about Fight Club again? Uh, no. I'm not talking about Fight Club. With that having been said, that's all for today, folks. Don't forget to hit subscribe and click the notification icon to stay up to date on all my content. And if there's anything else you'd like to request, please don't hesitate to ask. As always, it's been a pleasure. Niat here with Film Comics Explained. Thanks for stopping by.